So the final part of this chapter, finally, we are going to be looking at uh, chemical coordination in plants using hormones. I realized as I was making the videos, it has gone up to 22 videos for just this chapter alone. Easily the longest, uh, easily the largest amount of videos I've made for a particular chapter, which is a testament to how many things there are to study in this chapter. So, without wasting time, just like humans, uh, plants also produce hormones. And we have studied one type of plant hormone in chapter 14, and that was abscisic acid or ABA. And the response of the plants towards ABA is the stoma. There is a bit of a spelling error. It's not stomo, okay? It's stoma closure during water stress, okay? Sorry for that typo. And we've learned that in chapter 14. I will provide a link to the top right corner if you need to refresh your mind on that particular chapter. Now, the other two hormones that we're going to be looking at is auxin, number two, which causes the stem elongation, where obviously the plant becomes taller, and something known as gibberellins, which is another type of uh, plant hormone. And here's the thing, it just like auxin, it can also cause stem elongation to make the plant stem longer. Uh, and uh, gibberellins also helps with the seed germination. What exactly is the meaning of seed germination? Well, usually when the seed is near the soil or within the soil, when it's stimulated under specific conditions, the embryo within the seeds will start to develop and a new plant will emerge. And gibberellins is an important hormone which regulates this process as well. So we're going to look at auxin and gibberellins for this particular video. Now, without wasting time, I want you to understand the general overview of stem elongation. You don't need to memorize this, but I want to talk about stem elongation in general. Uh, we just want to give a little bit of an overview of what stem elongation is supposed to entail. Uh, the reason is because we have to understand how auxin and gibberellins affect this process. So you see, what I'm drawing over here is, I'm just drawing out a stem and each of those boxes represents the cell in the plant stem. Yes, I know that the plant stem has the xylem, phloem and all that, but I'm just going to keep it as simple as possible. And I'm highlighting one particular cell and I'm just drawing out that highlighted cell at the bottom. So you can see that that's just the individual plant cell that I've highlighted. Now, for the stem of the plant to elongate, the first thing that needs to happen is mitosis needs to take place. So I want you to compare the stem on the left and the stem on the right. The stem on the right is after mitosis. What do you notice happens to the number of cells? The number of cells have doubled because each of the cells have undergone mitosis, correct? Here's the thing though, even though the number of cells have increased, the overall length of the stem still remains very much the same because the two newly divided cells are not as long, they are still quite small. They are not as long as the mature cell on the left over there. So has the stem increased in height? No, it has not. For the stem to actually increase in height, what needs to happen is each of the cells have to elongate. And when the cells elongate, each of the cells elongate, as the overall cells elongate, it will stretch and become longer. So you can see those two cells becoming longer, right? And if all the cells in the plant, in the plant stem elongate uh, at the same time, the overall length of the stem will increase. So I've also highlighted those two uh, I've also highlighted those two uh, cells over there, those two newly divided cells on the middle one, and those cells on the right, they have elongated. So as those cells elongate, the overall stem has become longer. So as a reminder, that was just that one plant cell, okay, in the beginning. Those were the same plant cells, but they have undergone mitosis and cell division, so it produces two newly divided plant cells. And those are the two plant cells that have now undergone cell elongation. And because of the cell elongation, the overall length of the stem has become taller. So what does this have to do with anything? Because auxin and gibberellins are the hormones that will affect cell elongation. It doesn't actually affect mitosis and cell division per se. Auxin and gibberellins are more responsible towards the elongation of the plant cells. Now, here's the weird thing. 
plant cells have the cellulose cell wall, which is very rigid, right? So how can the cells elongate when the cell walls are limiting the growth of the cell or the elongation of the cell? This is what we have to talk about in this particular video. Now, before we go into that in detail, I do want to explain something about the plant cell wall. Uh, you do need to know this for this particular part of the chapter. So uh, take it in stride. Okay, so I'm just drawing out the a single plant cell and I've highlighted part of the cell surface membrane and the cell wall and then I'm just drawing it out. You can see the phospholipid bilayer which is the cell surface membrane and also the plant cell wall which I've highlighted in beige. Yeah, beige. Let's go with that. And remember, the plant cell wall is made out of cellulose and the cellulose joins together to become something called cellulose microfibrils. We learned this in chapter 2, Biological Molecules. Um, and between the cellulose microfibrils, uh, they can also have hydrogen bonds linking one to another. Okay, hydrogen bonds will help to strengthen the cellulose microfibrils so that they can form the cellulose fibers as well. Now, a bit of extra information is needed for this part of the chapter. The plant cell wall does not just contain cellulose. It contains other things which helps to strengthen and uh, make the cellulose more rigid. And those things are referred to as something called hemicellulose. Hemicellulose are just molecules that help. I've represented the hemicellulose in those blue color lines. And what they do is they attach the cellulose microfibrils together to keep them from moving apart. The hydrogen bonds help it, but also the hemicellulose helps it as well to keep the cellulose microfibrils in place. And there are also these weird little proteins inside the uh, cellulose, the plant cell wall, which are known as expansin. And I've represented the expansin as sleeping proteins to imply that they are inactive currently. And there is also another type of enzyme present in the plant cell wall known as XET. Now, you do need to know this for this part of the chapter. I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. Okay, so yeah, I know it's a bit too much, but yeah, the plant cell wall contains the expansin proteins, hemicellulose, and XET. These are new things that I'm introducing. Now, the weird thing is, right now, if the plant is to stretch, they have to sort of weaken the cell wall because the cell wall is very, the cell wall is the thing that is limiting the plant cells from actually stretching and becoming longer. So if the plant cell is to stretch and elongate, the cell wall has to be momentarily or temporarily weakened. And that's what oxin and gibberellins are supposed to do. So how exactly does auxin cause stem elongation? So I'm drawing out the newly divided cell over there on the left, and I'm just highlighted the uh, the blue color part is the cytoplasm of the cell. You can also see the phospholipid bilayer, which forms the cell surface membrane. And here I'm drawing out the plant cell wall, and I'm only drawing out cellulose microfibrils, hydrogen bonds represented in those green color dotted lines, and expansive. I'm not drawing hemicellulose because auxin has nothing to do with the hemicellulose at all, okay? Auxin directly deals with expansive. Now, on the cell surface membrane of the plant cell, they also have some membrane proteins, and the membrane proteins are auxin receptors, proton pump, potassium ion channel, and aquaporin. Now, the moment you see proton pumps, potassium ion channel, and aquaporin, hopefully you might suddenly make a link. You might be thinking, wait a second, I've seen this combination of proteins before. The proton pump, potassium ion channel, and aquaporin. Where have I seen that? You saw that in the guard cells. And during the guard cell, when we were talking about the opening and closing of the guard cells, I told you the relationship between the hydrogen ions, potassium ions, and water. I said to you that protons or hydrogen ions hit potassium ions, and wherever potassium ion goes, water follows. And this principle applies now to the stem elongation part of the lesson. So, what exactly does auxin do? 
keeping it very simple as possible. Auxin, the first thing that it does is auxin, which is produced by plant cells, will bind to the receptor or the auxin receptor because they are complementary. So when they bind to the auxin receptor, I've just highlighted that to show you that it has bound to it. It will activate the proton pump to actively pump out hydrogen ions into the cell wall. Same thing like how it did it in the guard cell as well. Right now, when the proton pump actively pumps out protons or hydrogen ions into the cell wall, it acidifies the cell wall because hydrogen ions are responsible to make something acidic. So the pH of the cell wall will decrease. And when the pH of the cell wall will dec uh, decreases, uh, this actually causes the expansin, which was inactive, to become active. And when the so as you can see here, the expansin have the expansin proteins have now woken up. Okay, and when they have woken up, they are now active. The expansins will disrupt the hydrogen bonds within the cellulose microfibril, which temporarily weakens the plant cell wall. We want to weaken the plant cell wall, remember, because we want to allow the plant cells to stretch, and to do so, we have to weaken the cell wall. So, in this case, what happens then is, remember, protons or hydrogen ions hit potassium ions, and wherever potassium ion goes, water follows. So, now that the uh, cellulose microfibril is momentarily weakened, it will also activate the potassium ion channels to open, which causes potassium ions to rush into the cell, which reduces the water potential inside the cell. My God, it sounds, sounds like I'm singing. Uh, but, and then, what happens then is, uh, when the water potential inside the cell uh, decreases, water also rushes into the cell as well. So for number five, just mentioned, potassium ion and water rushes into the cell, which increases the internal pressure. And when it increases the internal pressure within the cell, what happens then? It causes the cellulose microfibrils to move further apart. As you can see, the cellulose microfibril is just pushing it downwards. Uh, so the cellulose microfibril is being pushed further apart. They're just starting to get pushed further and further and further away from each other and when they are moving further away from each other what happens then is the plant cells will also stretch basically and this allows the cells to elongate that's how cell elongation happens. Now, after the cells elongate, the plants will actually synthesize new cell wall to reinforce it. You don't have to know that in detail. You don't have to talk about how it strengthens the cell wall again. You just have to mention that auxin, um, that auxin merely weakens the cell wall. So to mention it all back in detail, let's mention process number one. I'm going to change the shape of the auxin receptor here because I didn't like that earlier shape. So the first process that happens, number one, the auxin binds to the receptor. Okay, done. And I've also highlighted that as well in yellow just to show you where that's happening. Number two, the proton pump actively transports hydrogen ion into the cell wall. This is important because it acidifies the cell wall or lowers the pH and it activates the expansin proteins and the expansin proteins will break the hydrogen bonds between the cellulose microfibril which temporarily weakens the cell wall. Potassium ions and water rushes into the cell causing the cell wall to stretch and when the cell wall stretches the cellulose microfibrils move further apart from each other and look at the plant cell on this side here. It was quite small and now because of the stretching it has elongated. That's how auxin causes cell elongation. Okay, so we are done with auxin. The next one we have to see is gibberellin because gibberellin also causes stem elongation, but it does so in a slightly different mechanism. To keep it very simple, I'm just going to draw out the cellulose microfibril, the hemicellulose, and also the XET enzymes. All we just have to know for this here is as follows. When gibberellins are secreted, the XET enzymes, or you can just call it XET, it will move towards the hemicellulose and what it does is it will break the bonds between the hemicellulose. When it breaks the bond between the hemicellulose, what happens then? As you can see, the bonds are broken in this case. When the bonds are broken, they are no longer linking the cellulose microfibrils together and through a different mechanism, you don't have to go into the detail, all you just have to say is the cellulose microfibrils now move further apart. You don't have to mention anything about the proton pumps, the potassium ion channel, and water. We don't care about that. So as the cellulose microfibrils move further apart, 
it allows the expansion of the cell wall leading to cell elongation. That's it, okay? That's what you just have to know for gibberellins and stem elongation. The gibberellins will activate the XCT. The XCT breaks the bond between the hemicellulose. Cellulose microfibrils move further apart and it allows the expansion of the cell wall. That's all we have to mention for gibberellins when it comes to stem elongation. So I hope that's fine. Now, the last one that we have to actually talk about is gibberellins and also seed germination. You see, seeds have to germinate in specific conditions. For example, if the soil is very hot and dry, the, the seed, it might not be a suitable time for the seed to germinate and grow because the plant might not have access to water. So that's not a good time. But let's say the area is a place where it rains quite often and the soil is full of water, the seed will be activated because if the soil is full of water, it implies that the, if the plant were to grow, it has a good chance of survival because there is water readily available in the surrounding environment. So the presence of water has to trigger the germination in the seeds. But what does that have to do with gibberellins? So let's talk about this. But before we go through that, we just have to see the internal seed structure. The seed has an outer hard covering. Some books will refer to it as the testa. You don't need to know that in detail. And the internal part of the seed actually has this layer known as the aluron layer. Now, um, I'm going to explain the aluron layer, which I've highlighted in pink. Uh, then you also have the embryo. The embryo is just a ball of cells. The reason why I've represented the embryo with two colors is to just imply that some parts of the embryo will develop into the shoots, the leaves, and some parts of the embryo will become the roots. But again, it's just me being uh, highly specific, but it doesn't matter. And of course, there is a part of the seed known as the endosperm, which contains a lot of starch. And remember, starch is just a polysaccharide, which is a large carbohydrate. And when it's broken down, it will form the alpha glucose molecules. So process of seed germination, as I've told you earlier, uh, seed germination is triggered by the presence of water. So what happens first is water will enter the seed through this very tiny hole, okay? And when the water enters the seed, it will activate the embryo. And when it activates the embryo, the embryo releases the hormone known as gibberellins. Gibberellin will then diffuse towards the aluron layer. And when it diffuses into the aluron layer, it causes the aluron layer to synthesize amylase. Now, for process number four, you need to know how the aluron layer synthesizes the amylase. You do. We do We do go into the detail of that, but we are not going to cover it in this chapter. We are going to look at it in chapter 16. So what happens then is the amylase, which is a type of enzyme, if you studied O levels, you know that the amylase is this enzyme that is supposed to digest the starch in the endosperm. So when the amylase hydrolyzes the starch in the endosperm, as you can see, it's broken down, it becomes maltose, and from maltose, it becomes glucose. And guess what? The glucose will then diffuse towards the embryo. So now the embryo has a source of energy and the embryo can now undergo respiration to the, the embryo can undergo respiration to produce ATP and as it produces ATP it starts to grow. It undergoes cell division, mitosis and cell division and it starts to grow and the plant will emerge from the seed. That is the process of seed germination. And I've also given you the summary at the bottom over there as well. Okay, water enters the seed, embryo releases gibberellins, and so on and so forth at the bottom. Um, this is what you just have to know for gibberellins and seed germination for now. But how the gibberellin causes the aluron layer to synthesize amylase, which is step number four there, we will talk about that more in detail when we are covering chapter 16. But if a question just generally asks you, how does gibberellin stimulate seed germination? This is good enough, right? I hope you understand this part of the chapter when we are talking about the chemical coordination in plants. And with that being said, this chapter is finally over. So, yeah. <laughs> no more. I promise there's nothing more to cover for this chapter. 